Penguin Audiobooks presents The Dark Tower, Book One, The Gunslinger, by Stephen King. Read by George Guidel. Chapter One The Gunslinger. One. The man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. The desert was the apotheosis of all deserts, huge, standing to the sky for what looked like eternity in all directions. It was white and blinding and waterless, and without feature save for the faint, cloudy haze of the mountains which sketched themselves on the horizon, and the devil grass, which brought sweet dreams, nightmares, death. An occasional tombstone sign pointed the way. For once, the drifted track that cut its way through the thick crust of alkali had been a highway. Coaches and buckas had followed it. The world had moved on since then. The world had emptied. The gunslinger had been struck by a momentary dizziness, a kind of yawing sensation that made the entire world seem ephemeral, almost a thing that could be looked through. It passed, and, like the world upon whose hide he walked, he moved on. He passed the miles stolidly, not hurrying, not loafing. A hide water bag was slung around his middle like a bloated sausage. It was almost full. He had progressed through the kef over many years and had reached perhaps the fifth level. Had he been a manny holy man, he might not have even been thirsty. He could have watched his own body dehydrate with clinical, detached attention, watering its crevices and dark inner hollows only when his logic told him it must be done. He was not a manny, however, nor a follower of the man Jesus, and considered himself in no way holy. He was just an ordinary pilgrim, in other words and all he could say with real certainty was that he was thirsty. And even so, he had no particular urge to drink. In a vague way, all this pleased him. It was what the country required. It was a thirsty country. And he had, in his long life, been nothing if not adaptable. Below the water bag were his guns, carefully weighted to his hands. A plate had been added to each when they had come to him from his father, who had been lighter and not so tall. The two belts crisscrossed above his crotch. The holsters were oiled too deeply for even this Philistine son to crack. The stocks of the guns were sandalwood, yellow and finely grained. Rawhide tie-downs held the holsters loosely to his thighs, and they swung a bit with a step. They had rubbed away the bluing of his jeans, and thinned the cloth in a pair of arcs that looked almost like smiles. The brass casings of the cartridges looped into the gun belts heliographed in the sun. They were fewer now. The leather made subtle, creaking noises. His shirt, the no color of rain or dust, was open at the throat with a rawhide thong dangling loosely in hand-punched eyelets. His hat was gone, so was the horn he had once carried. Gone for years, that horn, spilled from the hand of a dying friend, and he missed them both. He breasted a gently rising dune, although there was no sand here, the desert was hard pan, and even the harsh winds that blew when dark came raised only an aggravating harsh dust like scouring powder, and saw the kicked remains of a tiny campfire on the lee side, the side the sun would quit earliest. 
small signs like this, once more affirming the man in black's possible humanity, never failed to please him. His lips stretched in the pitted, flaked remains of his face. The grin was gruesome, painful. He squatted. His quarry had burned the devil grass, of course. It was the only thing out here that would burn. It burned with a greasy, flat light, and it burned slow. Border dwellers had told him that devils lived even in the flames. They burned it but would not look into the light. They said the devils hypnotized, beckoned, would eventually draw the one who looked into the fires. And the next man foolish enough to look into the fire might see you. The burned grass was crisscrossed in the now familiar ideographic pattern and crumbled to gray senselessness before the gunslinger's prodding hand. There was nothing in the remains but a charred scrap of bacon which he ate thoughtfully. It had always been this way. The gunslinger had followed the man in black across the desert for two months now, across the endless, screamingly monotonous purgatorial wastes, and had yet to find spoor other than the hygienic, sterile ideographs of the man in black's campfires. He had not found a can, a bottle, or a water bag. The gunslinger had left four of those behind, like dead snakeskins. He hadn't found any dung. He assumed the man in black buried it. Perhaps the campfires were a message, spelled out one great letter at a time. Keep your distance, partner, it might say. Or the end draweth nigh. Or maybe even come and get me. It didn't matter what they said or didn't say. He had no interest in messages if messages they were. What mattered was that these remains were as cold as all the others. Yet he had gained. He knew he was closer, but didn't know how he knew. A kind of smell, perhaps. That didn't matter, either. He would keep going until something changed. And if nothing changed, he would keep going anyway. There would be water if God willed it, the old-timers said. Water if God willed it, even in the desert. The gunslinger stood up, brushing his hands. No other trace. The wind, razor-sharp, had of course filed away even what scant tracks the hard pan might once have held. No man scat, no cast-off trash, never a sign of where those things might have been buried. Nothing. Only these cold campfires along the ancient highway moving southeast and the relentless range-finder in his own head. Although, of course, it was more than that. The pool southeast was more than just a sense of direction. It was even more than... Magnetism. He sat down and allowed himself a short pull from the water bag. He thought of that momentary dizziness earlier in the day, that sense of being almost untethered from the world, and wondered what it might have meant. Why should that dizziness make him think of his horn and the last of his old friends, both lost so long ago at Jericho Hill? He still had the guns, his father's guns, and surely they were more important than horns, or even friends. Weren't they? The question was oddly troubling, but since there seemed to be no answer but the obvious one, he put it aside, possibly for later consideration. He scanned the desert and then looked up at the sun, which was now sliding into a far quadrant of the sky that was, disturbingly, not quite true west. He got up, removed his threadbare gloves from his belt, and began to pull devil grass for his own fire, which he laid over the ashes the man in black had left. He found the irony, like his thirst, bitterly appealing. 
he did not take the flint and steel from his purse until the remains of the day were only fugitive heat in the ground beneath him and a sardonic orange line on the monochrome horizon. He sat with his gunner drawn across his lap and watched the southeast patiently, looking toward the mountains, not hoping to see the thin straight line of smoke from a new campfire, not expecting to see an orange spark of flame, but watching anyway, because watching was a part of it and had its own bitter satisfaction. You will not see what you do not look for, maggot. Court would have said. Open the gobs the gods gave you, will you not? But there was nothing. He was close, but only relatively so, not close enough to see smoke at dusk or the orange wink of a campfire. He laid the flint down the steel rod and struck his spark to the dry, shredded grass, muttering the old and powerful nonsense words as he did, Spark a dark, where's my sire? Will I lay me? Will I stay me? Bless this camp with fire. It was strange how some of childhood's words and ways fell at the wayside and were left behind, while others clamped tight and rode for life, growing the heavier to carry as time passed. He lay down upwind of his little blazon, letting the dream smoke blow out toward the waste. The wind, except for occasional gyrating dust devils, was constant. Above, the stars were unwinking, also constant. Suns and worlds by the million. Dizzying constellations, cold fire in every primary hue. As he watched, the sky washed from violet to ebony. A meteor etched a brief spectacular arc below Old Mother and winked out. The fire threw strange shadows as the devil grass burned its slow way down into new patterns, not ideograms, but a straightforward crisscross, vaguely frightening in its own no-nonsense surety. He had laid his fuel in a pattern that was not artful but only workable. It spoke of blacks and whites. It spoke of a man who might straighten bad pictures in strange hotel rooms. The fire burned its steady, slow flame, and phantoms danced in its incandescent core. The gunslinger did not see. The two patterns, art and craft, were welded together as he slept. The wind moaned, a witch with cancer in her belly. Every now and then a perverse downdraft would make the smoke whirl and puff toward him, and he breathed some of it in. It built dreams in the same way that a small irritant may build a pearl in an oyster. The gunslinger occasionally moaned with the wind. The stars were as indifferent to this as they were to wars, crucifixions, resurrections. This also would have pleased him. Two. He had come down off the last of the foothills, leading the mule, whose eyes were already dead and bulging with the heat. He had passed the last town three weeks before, and since then there had only been the deserted coach track and an occasional huddle of border-dwellers' saw-dwellings. The huddles had degenerated into single dwellings, most inhabited by lepers or madmen. He found the madmen better company. One had given him a stainless steel silver compass and bade him give it to the man Jesus. The gunslinger took it gravely. If he saw him, he would turn over the compass. He did not expect that he would, but anything was possible. Once he saw a tahin, this one a man with a raven's head, but the misbegotten thing fled at his hail, cawing what might have been words, what might even have been curses. 
Five days had passed since the last hut, and he had begun to suspect there would be no more when he topped the last eroded hill and saw the familiar low-backed sod roof. The dweller, a surprisingly young man with a wild shock of strawberry hair that reached almost to his waist, was weeding a scrawny stand of corn with zealous abandon. The mule let out a wheezing grunt, and the dweller looked up, glaring blue eyes coming target center on the gunslinger in a moment. The dweller was unarmed, with no bolt nor bar the gunslinger could see. He raised both hands in curt salute to the stranger, and then bent to the corn again, humping up the row next to his hut with back bent, tossing devil grass and an occasional stunted corn plant over his shoulder. His hair flopped and flew in the wind that now came directly from the desert with nothing to break it. The gunslinger came down the hill slowly, leading the mule on which his water skins sloshed. He paused by the edge of the lifeless-looking corn patch, drew a drink from one of his skins to start the saliva, and spat into the arid soil. Life for your crop. Life for your own, the dweller answered and stood up. His back popped audibly. He surveyed the gunslinger without fear. The little of his face, visible between beard and hair, seemed unmarked by the rot, and his eyes, while a bit wild, seemed sane. Long days and pleasant nights, stranger. And may you have twice the number. Unlikely, the dweller replied and voiced a curt laugh. "'I don't have no but corn and beans,' he said. "'Corn's free, but you'll have to kick something in for the beans. A man brings them out once in a while. He don't stay long.' The dweller laughed shortly. "'Afraid of spirits. Afraid of the bird-man, too.' "'I saw him. The bird-man, I mean. He fled me. "'Yar, he's lost his way. Claims to be looking for a place called Algol Ciento. Only sometimes he calls it Blue Haven, or Heaven, I can't make out which. The gunslinger shook his head. Well, he don't bite, and he don't bide, so fuck him. Is he alive or dead? Alive, the gunslinger said. You speak as the money do. I was with him a while, but that was no life for me. Too chummy they are, and always looking for holes in the world. This was true. The gunslinger reflected the many folk were great travelers. The two of them looked at each other in silence for a moment, and then the dweller put out his hand. Brown is my name. The gunslinger shook and gave his own name. As he did so, a scrawny raven croaked from the low peak of the sod roof. The dweller gestured at it briefly. That's Zoltan! At the sound of its name, the raven croaked again and flew across to Brown. It landed on the dweller's head and roosted, talons firmly twined in the wild thatch of hair. "'Screw you!' Zoltan croaked brightly. "'Screw you and the horse you rode in on!' The gunslinger nodded amiably. "'Beans, beans, a musical fruit!' the raven recited, inspired. "'The more you eat, the more you toot!' "'You teach him that?' That's all he wants to learn, I guess, Brown said. Try to teach him the Lord's Prayer once. His eyes traveled out beyond the hut for a moment, toward the gritty, featureless hardpan. Guess this ain't Lord's Prayer country. You're a gunslinger, that right? Yes. He hunkered down and brought out his makings. Zoltan launched himself from Brown's head and landed flittering on the gunslinger's shoulder. Thought your kind was gone. Then you see different, don't you? Did he come from in-world? Long ago, the gunslinger agreed. Anything left there? To this the gunslinger made no reply, but his face suggested this was a topic better not pursued. After the other one, I guess. Yes. 
The inevitable question followed, how long since he passed by? Brown shrugged. I don't know. Time's funny out here. Distance and direction, too. More than two weeks, less than two months. The bean man's been twice since he passed. I guess six weeks. That's probably wrong. The more you eat, the more you toot, Zoltan said. Did he lay by? The gunslinger asked. Brown nodded. He stayed supper, same as you will, I guess. We passed the time. The gunslinger stood up, and the bird flew back to the roof, squawking. He felt an odd, trembling eagerness. What did he talk about? Brown cocked an eyebrow at him. Not much. Did it ever rain, and when did I come here, and had I buried my wife? He asked was she of the money folk, and I said, yeah, because it seemed like he already knew. I did most of the talking, which ain't usual. He paused, and the only sound was the stark wind. He's a sorcerer, ain't he? Among other things. Brown nodded slowly. I knew. He dropped a rabbit out of his sleeve, all gutted and ready for the pot. Are you? A sorcerer? He laughed. I'm just a man. You'll never catch him. I'll catch him. They looked at each other, a sudden depth of feeling between them, the dweller upon his dust-puff dry ground, the gunslinger on the hard pan that shelved down to the desert. He reached for his flint. Here! Brown produced a sulfur-headed match and struck it with a grimed nail. The gunslinger pushed the tip of his smoke into the flame and drew. Thanks. You'll want to fill your skins, the dweller said, turning away. Springs under the eaves and back. I'll start dinner. The gunslinger stepped gingerly over the rows of corn and went around back. The spring was at the bottom of a hand-dug well, lined with stones to keep the powdery earth from caving. As he descended the rickety ladder, the gunslinger reflected that the stones must represent two years' work easily. Hauling, dragging, laying. The water was clear but slow-moving, and filling the skins was a long chore. While he was topping the second, Zoltan perched on the lip of the well. Screw you and the horse you rode in on, he advised. The gunslinger looked up, startled. The shaft was about fifteen feet deep. Easy enough for Brown to drop a rock on him, break his head, and steal everything on him. A crazy or a rotter wouldn't do it. Brown was neither. Yet he liked Brown. And so he pushed the thought out of his mind and got the rest of the water God had willed. Whatever else God willed was Ka's business, not his. When he came through the hut's door and walked down the steps, the hovel proper was set below ground level, designed to catch and hold the coolness of the nights. Brown was poking ears of corn into the embers of a tiny fire with a crude hardwood spatula. Two ragged plates had been set at opposite ends of a dun blanket. Water for the beans was just beginning to bubble in a pot hung over the fire. I'll pay for the water, too. Brown did not look up. The water's a gift from God, as I think thee knows. Papa Doc brings the beans. The gunslinger grunted a laugh and sat down with his back against one rude wall, folded his arms and closed his eyes. After a little, the smell of roasting corn came to his nose. There was a pebbly rattle as Brown dumped a paper of dry beans into the pot. An occasional tuck, tuck, tuck as Zoltan walked restlessly on the roof. He was tired. He had been going sixteen and sometimes eighteen hours a day between here and the horror that had occurred in Tall, the last village. And he had been afoot for the last twelve days. The mule was at the end of its endurance, only living because it was a habit. Once he had known a boy named Shimi, who'd had a mule. Shimi was gone now. 
They were all gone now. And there was only the two of them, him and the man in black. He had heard rumor of other lands beyond this, green lands in a place called Midworld. But it was hard to believe. Out here, green lands seemed like a child's fantasy. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Two weeks, Brown had said, or as many as six. Didn't matter. There had been calendars in Tull, and they had remembered the man in black because of the old man he had healed on his way through. Just an old man dying of the weed, an old man of thirty-five. And if Brown was right... He had closed a good deal of distance on the man in black since then. But the desert was next. And the desert would be hell. Tuck, tuck, tuck. Lend me your wings, bird. I'll spread them and fly on the thermals. He slept. Three. Brown woke him up an hour later. It was dark. The only light was the dull cherry glare of the banked embers. Your mule has passed on, Brown said. Tell you sorry. Dinner's ready. How? Brown shrugged. Roasted and boiled. How else? You picky? No, the mule. It just laid over, that's all. It looked like an old mule. And with a touch of apology... Zoltan at the eyes. Oh. He might have expected it. All right. Brown surprised him again when they sat down to the blanket that served as a table by asking a brief blessing. Rain, health, expansion to the spirit. Do you believe in an afterlife? The gunslinger asked him as Brown dropped three ears of hot corn onto his plate. Brown nodded. I think this is it. Four. The beans were like bullets, the corn tough. Outside, the prevailing wind snuffled and whined around the ground-level eaves. The gunslinger ate quickly, ravenously, drinking four cups of water with the meal. Halfway through, there was a machine gun rapping at the door. Brown got up and let Zoltan in. The bird flew across the room and hunched moodily in the corner. Musical fruit, he muttered. You ever think about eating him? The gunslinger asked. The dweller laughed. Animals that talk be tough, he said. Birds, billy bumblers, human beans, they be tough eating. After dinner, the gunslinger offered his tobacco. The dweller, Brown, accepted eagerly. Now, the gunslinger thought, now the questions will come. But Brown asked no questions. He smoked tobacco that had been grown in Garland years before and looked at the dying embers of the fire. It was already noticeably cooler in the hovel. Lead us not into temptation! Zoltan said suddenly, apocalyptically. The gunslinger started as if he had been shot at. He was suddenly sure all this was an illusion, that the man in black had spun a spell and was trying to tell him something in a maddeningly obtuse, symbolic way. Do you know, Tull? he asked suddenly. Brown nodded. Came through it to get here. Went back once to sell corn and drink a glass of whiskey. It rained that year, lasted maybe fifteen minutes. The ground just seemed to open and suck it up. An hour later it was just as white and dry as ever, but the corn, God, the corn, you could see it grow. That wasn't so bad, but you could hear it, as if the rain had given it a mouth. It wasn't a happy sound. It seemed to be sighing and groaning its way out of the earth. He paused. I had extra, so I took it and sold it. Papa Doc said he'd do it, but he would have cheated me, so I went. You don't like town? No. I almost got killed there, the gunslinger said. Do you say so? Set my watch and warrant on it. 
and I killed a man that was touched by God. The gunslinger said, Only it wasn't God. It was the man with the rabbit up his sleeve, the man in black. He laid you a trap. You say true, I say thank you. They looked at each other across the shadows, the moment taking on overtones of finality. Now the questions will come. But Brown still had no questions to ask. His cigarette was down to a smoldering roach, but when the gunslinger tapped his poke, Brown shook his head. Zotan shifted restlessly, seemed about to speak, subsided. "'Will I tell you about it?' the gunslinger asked. "'Ordinarily I'm not much of a talker, but sometimes talking helps. I'll listen.' The gunslinger searched for words to begin, and found none. "'I have to pass water,' he said. Brown nodded. "'Pass it in the corn, please.' "'Sure.' He went up the stairs and out into the dark. The stars glittered overhead, the wind pulsed. His urine arched out over the powdery cornfield in a wavering stream. The man in black had drawn him here. It wasn't beyond possibility that Brown was the man in black. He might be. The gunslinger shut these useless and upsetting thoughts away. The only contingency he had not learned how to bear was the possibility of his own madness. He went back inside. Have you decided if I'm an enchantment yet? Brown asked, amused. The gunslinger paused on the tiny landing, startled, then he came down slowly and sat. The thought crossed my mind. Are you? If I am, I don't know it. This wasn't a terribly helpful answer, but the gunslinger decided to let it pass. I started to tell you about Tull. Is it growing? It's dead, the gunslinger said. I killed it. He thought of adding, and now I'm going to kill you, if for no other reason than I don't want to have to sleep with one eye open. But had he come to such behavior? If so, why bother to go on at all? Why, if he had become what he pursued? Brown said, I don't want nothing from you, gunslinger except to still be here when you move on. I won't beg for my life, but that don't mean I don't want it yet a while longer. The gunslinger closed his eyes. His mind whirled. Tell me what you are, he said thickly. Just a man? One who means you no harm. And I'm still willing to listen if you're willing to talk. To this the gunslinger made no reply. I guess you won't feel right about it unless I invite you, Brown said. And so I do. Will you tell me about Tall? The gunslinger was surprised to find at this time the words were there. He began to speak in flat bursts that slowly spread into an even, slightly toneless narrative. He found himself oddly excited. He talked deep into the night. Brown did not interrupt at all. Neither did the bird. Five. He'd bought the mule in Pricetown, and when he reached Tull it was still fresh. The sun had set an hour earlier, but the gunslinger had continued traveling, guided by the town glow in the sky, then by the uncannily clear notes of a honky-tonk piano playing Hey Jude. The road widened as it took on tributaries. Here and there were overhead spark lights, all of them long dead. The forests were long gone now, replaced by the monotonous flat prairie country, endless Desolate fields gone to Timothy and low shrubs. Eerie, deserted estates guarded by brooding, shadowed mansions where demons undeniably walked. 
leering, empty shanties where the people had either moved on or had been moved along. An occasional dweller's hovel, given away by a single flickering point of light in the dark, or by sullen, inbred clan fams toiling silently in the fields by day. Corn was the main crop, but there were beans and also some pokeberries. An occasional scrawny cow stared at him lumpishly from between peeled alder poles. Coaches had passed him four times— twice coming and twice going, nearly empty as they came up on him from behind and bypassed him and his mule, fuller as they headed back toward the forests of the north. Now and then a farmer passed with his feet up on the splashboard of his bucka, careful not to look at the man with the guns. It was ugly country. It had showered twice since he had left Pricetown, grudgingly both times. Even the Timothy looked yellow and dispirited. Pass on by, country. He had seen no sign of the man in black. Perhaps he had taken a coach. The road made a bend, and beyond it the gunslinger clucked the mule to a stop and looked down at Tall. It was at the floor of a circular, bowl-shaped hollow, a shoddy jewel in a cheap setting. There were a number of lights, most of them clustered around the area of the music. There looked to be four streets, three running at right angles to the coach road, which was the main avenue of the town. Perhaps there would be a café. He doubted it, but perhaps. He clucked at the mule. More houses sporadically lined the road now, most of them still deserted. He passed a tiny graveyard with moldy, leaning wooden slabs overgrown and choked by the rank devil grass. Perhaps five hundred feet further on, he passed a chewed sign which said, Tall. The paint was flaked almost to the point of illegibility. There was another further on, but the gunslinger was not able to read that one at all. A fool's chorus of half-stoned voices was rising in the final protracted lyric of Hey Jude. Na, 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 hey Jude, as he entered the town proper. It was a dead sound, like the wind in the hollow of a rotted tree. Only the prosaic thump and pound of the honky-tonk piano saved him from seriously wondering if the man in black might not have raised ghosts to inhabit a deserted town. He smiled a little at the thought. There were people on the streets, but not many. Three ladies wearing black slacks and identical high-collared blouses passed by on the opposite boardwalk, not looking at him with pointed curiosity. Their faces seemed to swim above their all but invisible bodies like pallid balls with eyes. A solemn old man with a straw hat, perched firmly on top of his head, watched him from the steps of a boarded-up mercantile store. A scrawny tailor with a late customer paused to watch him go by. He held up the lamp in his window for a better look. The gunslinger nodded. Neither the tailor nor his customer nodded back. He could feel their eyes resting heavily upon the low-slung holsters that lay against his hips. A young boy, perhaps thirteen, and a girl who might have been his sissa or his jilly child, crossed the street a block up, pausing imperceptibly. Their footfalls raised little hanging clouds of dust. Here in town most of the street-side lamps worked, but they weren't electric. Their isinglass sides were cloudy with congealed oil. Some had been crashed out. There was a livery with a just-hanging-on look to it, probably depending on the coach line for its survival. Three boys were crouched silently around a marble ring drawn in the dust to one side of the barn's gaping maw, smoking corn shuck cigarettes. They made long shadows in the yard. One had a scorpion's tail poked in the band of his hat, another had a bloated left eye bulging sightlessly from its socket. The gunslinger led his mule past them and looked into the dim depths of the barn. 
One lamp glowed sunkenly. A shadow jumped and flickered as a gangling old man in bib overalls forked loose Timothy Hay into the hayloft with big, grunting swipes of his fork. Hey, the gunslinger called. The fork faltered, and the hostler looked around with yellow-tinged eyes. Hey, yourself! I got a mule here. Good for you! The gunslinger flicked a heavy, unevenly milled gold piece into the semi-dark. It rang on the old chaff-drifted boards and glittered. The hostler came forward, bent, picked it up, squinted at the gunslinger. His eyes dropped to the gun belts, and he nodded sourly. How long you want him put up? A night or two, maybe longer. I ain't got no change for gold. Didn't ask for any. Shoot up money, the hostler muttered. What did you say? Nothing. The hostler caught the mule's bridle and led him inside. Rub him down, the gunslinger called. I expect to smell it on him when I come back. Hear me well. The old man did not turn. The gunslinger walked out to the boys crouched around the marble ring. They had watched the entire exchange with contemptuous interest. Long days and pleasant nights, the gunslinger offered conversationally. No answer. You fellows live in town? No answer, unless the scorpion's tail gave one, it seemed to nod. One of the boys removed a crazily tilted twist of cornchuck from his mouth, grasped a green cat's-eye marble, and squirted it into the dirt circle. It struck a croaker and knocked it outside. He picked up the cat's-eye and prepared to shoot again. "'There a cafe in this town?' the gunslinger asked. One of them looked up, the youngest. There was a huge cold sore at the corner of his mouth, but his eyes were both the same size and full of an innocence that wouldn't last long in this shithole. He looked at the gunslinger with hooded, brimming wonder that was touching and frightening. Might get a burger at Shebs. That the honky-tonk? The boy nodded. Yar! The eyes of his mates had turned ugly and hostile. He would probably pay for having spoken up in kindness. The gunslinger touched the brim of his hat. I'm grateful. It's good to know someone in this town is bright enough to talk. He walked past, mounted the boardwalk, and started down toward Shebs, hearing the clear, contemptuous voice of one of the others, hardly more than a childish treble. Weed-eater! How long you been screwing your sister, Charlie? Weed-eater! Then the sound of a blow and a cry. There were three flaring kerosene lamps in front of Shebs, one to each side, and one nailed above the drunk-hung bat-wing doors. The chorus of Hey Jude had petered out, and the piano was plinking some other old ballad. Voices murmured like broken threads. The gunslinger paused outside for a moment, looking in. Sawdust floor, spittoons by the tipsy-legged tables, a plank bar on sawhorses, a gummy mirror behind it reflecting the piano player who wore an inevitable piano stool slouch. The front of the piano had been removed so you could watch the wooden keys wonk up and down as the contraption was played. The bartender was a straw-haired woman wearing a dirty blue dress. One strap was held with a safety pin. There were perhaps six townies in the back of the room, juicing and playing Watch Me apathetically. Another half-dozen were grouped loosely about the piano, four or five at the bar, and an old man with wild gray hair collapsed at a table by the doors. The gunslinger went in. Heads swiveled to look at him and his guns. There was a moment of near silence, except for the oblivious piano player who continued to tinkle. Then the woman mopped at the bar, and things shifted back. "'Watch me!' one of the players in the corner said, and matched three hearts with four spades, emptying his hand. The one with the hearts swore, pushed over his stake, and the next hand was dealt. The gunslinger approached the woman at the bar. 
You got meat? he asked. Sure. She looked him in the eye, and she might have been pretty when she started out. But the world had moved on since then. Now her face was lumpy, and there a livid scar went corkscrewing across her forehead. She had powdered it heavily, and the powder called attention to what it had been meant to camouflage. Clean beef. Threaded stock. It's dear, though. Threaded stock, my ass, the gunslinger thought. What you got in your cooler came from something with three eyes, six legs, or both. That's my guess, Lady Sai. I want three burgers and a beer, would it please you? Again that subtle shift in tone. Three hamburgers, mouths watered and tongues licked at saliva with slow lust. Three hamburgers. Had anyone here ever seen anyone eat three hamburgers at a go? That would go you five box. Do you can box? Dollars? She nodded, so she was probably saying bucks. That was his guess, anyway. That with the beer? he asked, smiling a little. Or is the beer extra? She didn't return the smile. I'll throw in the suds, once I see the color of your money, that is. The gunslinger put a gold piece on the bar, and every eye followed it. There was a smoldering charcoal cooker behind the bar and to the left of the mirror. The woman disappeared into a small room behind it and returned with meat on a paper. She scrimped out three patties and put them on the grill. The smell that arose was maddening. The gunslinger stood with stolid indifference, only peripherally aware of the faltering piano, the slowing of the card game, the sidelong glances of the barflies. The man was halfway up behind him. When the gunslinger saw him in the mirror, the man was almost completely bald, and his hand was wrapped around the haft of a gigantic hunting knife that was looped onto his belt like a holster. "'Go sit down,' the gunslinger said. "'Do yourself a favor, Cully.' The man stopped. His upper lip lifted unconsciously, like a dog's, and there was a moment of silence. Then he went back to his table, and the atmosphere shifted back again. Beer came in a cracked glass schooner. "'I ain't got change for gold,' the woman said truculently. "'Don't expect any.' She nodded angrily, as if this show of wealth, even at her benefit, incensed her. But she took his gold, and a moment later the hamburgers came on a cloudy plate, still red around the edges. Do you have salt? She gave it to him in a little crock she took from underneath the bar. White lumps he'd have to crumble with his fingers. Bread? No bread. He knew she was lying. But he also knew why, and didn't push it. The bald man was staring at him with cyanosed eyes, his hands clenching and unclenching on the splintered and gouged surface of his table. His nostrils flared with pulsating regularity, scooping up the smell of the meat. That, at least, was free. The gunslinger began to eat steadily, not seeming to taste, merely chopping the meat apart and forking it into his mouth, trying not to think of what the cow this had come from must have looked like. Threaded stock, she had said. Yes, quite likely. And pigs would dance the Kamala in the light of the peddler's moon. He was almost through, ready to call for another beer and roll a smoke, when the hand fell on his shoulder. He suddenly became aware that the room had once more gone silent, and he tasted tension in the air. He turned around and stared into the face of the man who had been asleep by the door when he entered. It was a terrible face. The odor of the devil grass was a rank miasma. The eyes were damned, the staring, glaring eyes of one who sees but does not see, eyes ever turned inward to the sterile hell of dreams beyond control, dreams unleashed, risen out of the stinking swamps of the unconscious. 
The woman behind the bar made a small moaning sound. The cracked lips writhed, lifted, revealing the green, mossy teeth, and the gunslinger thought, he's not even smoking it anymore, he's chewing it. He's really chewing it. And on the heels of that, he's a dead man. He should have been dead a year ago. And on the heels of that, the man in black did this. They stared at each other, the gunslinger and the man who had gone around the rim of madness. He spoke, and the gunslinger, dumbfounded, heard himself addressed in the high speech of Gilead. The gold for a favor, gunslinger sigh. Just one for a pretty... The high speech. For a moment his mind refused to track it. It had been years, God, centuries, millenniums. There was no more high speech. He was the last, the last gunslinger. The others were all... Numbed, he reached into his breast pocket and produced a gold piece. The split, scabbed, gangrenous hand reached for it, fondled it, held it up to reflect the greasy glare of the kerosene lamps. It threw off its proud, civilized glow, golden, reddish, bloody. Ah! An inarticulate sound of pleasure. The old man did a weaving turn and began moving back to his table, holding the coin at eye level, turning it, flashing it. The room was emptying rapidly, the bat wings shuttling madly back and forth. The piano player closed the lid of his instrument with a bang and exited after the others in long comic opera strides. Sheb! The woman screamed after him, her voice an odd mixture of fear and shrewishness. Sheb, you come back here! God damn it! Was that a name the gunslinger had heard before? He thought, yes, but there was no time to reflect upon it now or to cast his mind back. The old man, meanwhile, had gone back to his table. He spun the gold piece on the gouged wood, and the dead, alive eyes followed it with empty fascination. He spun it a second time, a third, and his eyelids drooped. The fourth time, and his head settled to the wood before the coin stopped. There, she said softly, furiously, you've driven out my trade. Are you satisfied? They'll be back, the gunslinger said. Not tonight they won't. Who is he? He gestured at the weed-eater. Go fuck yourself, sigh. I have to know, the gunslinger said patiently. He... he talked to you funny, she said. Nort never talked like that in his life. I'm looking for a man. You would know him. She stared at him, the anger dying. It was replaced with speculation, then with a high, wet gleam he had seen before. The rickety building ticked thoughtfully to itself. A dog barked brayingly far away. The gunslinger waited. She saw his knowledge, and the gleam was replaced by hopelessness, by a dumb knee that had no mouth. I guess maybe you know my price, she said. I got an itch I used to be able to take care of, but now I can't. He looked at her steadily. The scar would not show in the dark. Her body was lean enough so the desert and grit and grind hadn't been able to sag everything. And she'd once been pretty, maybe even beautiful. Not that it mattered. It would not have mattered if the grave beetles had nested in the arid blackness of her womb. It had all been written. Somewhere, some hand had put it all down in Ka's book. Her hands came up to her face, and there was still some juice left in her, enough to weep. Don't look. You don't have to look at me so mean. I'm sorry, the gunslinger said. I didn't mean to be mean. None of you mean it. She cried at him. 
closed the place up and put out the lights. She wept, hands at her face. He was glad she had her hands at her face. Not because of the scar, but because it gave her back her maidenhood, if not her head. The pin that held the strap of her dress glittered in the greasy light. Will he steal anything? I'll put him out if he will. No, she whispered. No, don't steal. Then put out the lights. She would not remove her hands until she was behind him, and she doused the lamps one by one, turning down the wicks and breathing the flames into extinction. Then she took his hand in the dark, and it was warm. She led him upstairs. There was no light to hide their act. Six. He made cigarettes in the dark, then lit them and passed one to her. The room held her scent, fresh lilac, pathetic. The smell of the desert had overlaid it. He realized he was afraid of the desert ahead. His name is Nort, she said. No harshness had been worn out of her voice. Just Nort. He died. The gunslinger waited. He was touched by God. The gunslinger said, I have never seen him. He was here ever since I can remember. Nort, I mean, not God. She laughed jaggedly into the dark. He had a honey wagon for a while. Started to drink, started to smell the grass, then to smoke it. The kids started to follow him around and sick their dogs onto him. He wore old green pants that stank. Do you understand? Yes. He started to chew it. At the last he just sat in there and didn't eat anything. He might have been a king in his mind. The children might have been his gestures and the dogs his princess. Yes. He died right in front of this place, she said. Came clumping down the boardwalk. His boots wouldn't wear out. They were engineer boots he found in the old train yard. With the children and dogs behind him, he looked like wire clothes hangers all wrapped and twirled together. You could see all the lights of hell in his eyes. But he was grinning, just like the grins the children carve into their sharp roots and pumpkins come reap. You could smell the dirt and the rot and the weed. It was running down from the corners of his mouth like green blood. I think he meant to come in and listen to Sheb play the piano. And right in front he stopped and cocked his head. I could see him, and I thought he heard a coach, although there was none do. Then he puked, and it was black and full of blood. It went right through that grin like sewer water through a grate. The stink was enough to make you want to run mad. He raised up his arms and just threw over. That was all. He died in his own vomit, with that grin on his face. A nice story. Oh, yes, thank you, Sai. This be a nice place. She was trembling beside him. Outside, the wind kept up its steady whine, and somewhere far away a door was banging, like a sound heard in a dream. Mice ran in the walls. The gunslinger thought in the back of his mind that it was probably the only place in town prosperous enough to support mice. He put a hand on her belly, and she started violently, then relaxed. The man in black, he said, you have to have it, don't you? You couldn't just throw me a fuck and go to sleep. I have to have it. All right, I tell you. She grasped his hand in both of hers and told him. Seven. He came in the late afternoon of the day Nort died, and the wind was whooping it up, pulling away the loose topsoil, sending sheets of grit and uprooted stalks of corn windmilling past. Jubal Kennerly had padlocked the livery, and the few other merchants had shuttered their windows and laid boards across the shutters. 
The sky was the yellow color of old cheese, and the clouds flew across it as if they had seen something horrifying in the desert wastes where they had so lately been. The gunslinger's quarry came in a rickety rig with a rippling tarp tied across its bed. There was a big howdy do of a grin on his face. They watched him come, and old man Kennelly lying by the window with a bottle in one hand and the loose, hot flesh of his second eldest daughter's left breast in the other, resolved not to be there if he should knock. But the man in black went by without slowing the bay that pulled his rig, and the spinning wheels spumed up dust that the wind clutched eagerly. He might have been a priest or a monk. He wore a black robe that had been flowered with dust, and a loose hood covered his head and obscured his features, but not that horrid, happy grin. The robe rippled and flapped. From beneath the garment's hem there peeped heavy, buckled boots with square toes. He pulled up in front of Shebs and tethered the horse, which lowered its head and grunted at the ground. Around the back of the rig he untied one flap, found a weathered saddlebag, threw it over his shoulder, and went in through the bat-wings. Alice watched him curiously, but no one else noticed his arrival. The regulars were drunk as lords. Sheb was playing Methodist hymns ragtime, and the grizzled layabouts who had come in early to avoid the storm and to attend Nort's wake had sung themselves hoarse. Sheb, drunk nearly to the point of senselessness, intoxicated and horny with his own continued existence, played with hectic, shuttlecock speed, fingers flying like looms. Voices screeched and hollered, never overcoming the wind, but sometimes seeming to challenge it. In the corner, Zachary had thrown Amy Feldon's skirts over her head and was painting reap charms on her knees. A few other women circulated. A fever seemed to be on all of them. The dull storm glow that filtered through the batwings seemed to mock them, however. Nort had been laid out on two tables in the center of the room. His engineer boots made a mystical V. His mouth hung open in a slack grin, although someone had closed his eyes and put slugs on them. His hands had been folded on his chest with a sprig of devil grass in them. He smelled like poison. The man in black pushed back his hood and came to the bar. Alice watched him, feeling trepidation mixed with the familiar want that hid within her. There was no religious symbol on him, although that meant nothing by itself. Whiskey, he said. His voice was soft and pleasant. I want the good stuff, honey. She reached under the counter and brought out a bottle of star. She could have palmed off the local pop skull on him as her best, but did not. She poured and the man in black watched her. His eyes were large, luminous. The shadows were too thick to determine their color exactly. Her need intensified. The hollering and whooping went on behind, unabated. Sheb, the worthless gilding, was playing about the Christian soldiers, and somebody had persuaded Aunt Mill to sing. Her voice, warped and distorted, cut through the babble like a dull axe through a calf's brain. "'Hey, Allie!' she went to serve, resentful of the stranger's silence, resentful of his no-color eyes, and her own restless groin." She was afraid of her needs. They were capricious and beyond her control. They might be the signal of change, which would in turn signal the beginning of her old age, a condition which in Tull was usually as short and bitter as a winter sunset. She drew beer until the keg was empty, then broached another. She knew better than to ask Sheb. He would come willingly enough like the dog he was, and would either chop off his own fingers or spume beer all over everything. The stranger's eyes were on her as she went about it. She could feel them. It's busy, he said when she returned. 
He had not touched his drink, merely rolled it between his palms to warm it. Wake, she said. I noticed the departed. They're bums, she said with sudden hatred. All bums. It excites them. He's dead, they're not. He was their butt when he was alive. It's not right that he should be their butt now. It's... She trailed off, not able to express what it was or how it was obscene. Weed eater? Yes. What else did he have? Her tone was accusing, but he did not drop his eyes, and she felt the blood rush to her face. I'm sorry, are you a priest? This must revolt you. I'm not, and it doesn't. He knocked the whiskey back neatly and did not grimace. Once more, please, once more with feeling, as they say in the world next door. She had no idea what that might mean, and was afraid to ask. I'll have to see the color of your coin first. I'm sorry. No need to be. He put a rough silver coin on the counter, thick on one edge, thin on the other, and she said, as she would say later, I don't have change for this. He shook his head, dismissing it, and watched absently as she poured again. Are you only passing through? she asked. He did not reply for a long time, and she was about to repeat when he shook his head impatiently. Don't talk trivialities. You're here with death. She recoiled, hurt and amazed, her first thought being that he had lied about his holiness to test her. You cared for him, he said flatly. Isn't that true? Who, Nort? She laughed, affecting annoyance to cover her confusion. I think you better... You're soft-hearted and a little afraid, he went on, and he was on the weed, looking out Hell's back door. And there he is. They've even slammed the door now, and you don't think they'll open it until it's time for you to walk through, isn't it so? What, are you drunk? Mr. Norton, he dayed, the man in black intoned, giving the words a sardonic little twist. Dead as anybody. Dead as you or anybody. Get out of my place. She felt a trembling, loathing spring up in her, but the warmth still radiated from her belly. It's all right, he said softly. It's all right. Wait. Just wait. The eyes were blue. She felt suddenly easy in her mind, as if she had taken a drug. Dead as anybody, he said. Do you see? She nodded dumbly, and he laughed aloud, a fine, strong, untainted laugh that swung heads around. He whirled and faced them, suddenly the center of attention. Aunt Mill faltered and subsided, leaving a cracked high note bleeding on the air. Sheb struck a discord and halted. They looked at the stranger uneasily. Sand rattled against the sides of the building. The silence held, spun itself out. Her breath had clogged in her throat, and she looked down and saw both hands pressed to her belly beneath the bar. They all looked at him, and he looked at them. Then the laugh burst forth again, strong, rich, beyond denial. But there was no urge to laugh along with him. "'I'll show you a wonder!' he cried at them. But they only watched him like obedient children taken to see a magician in whom they have grown too old to believe. The man in black sprang forward, and Aunt Mill drew away from him. He grinned fiercely and slapped her broad belly. A short, unwitting cackle was forced out of her, and the man in black threw back his head. It's better, isn't it? Aunt Mill cackled again, suddenly broke into sobs, and fled blindly through the doors. The others watched her go silently. 
The storm was beginning. Shadows followed each other, rising and falling on the white cyclorama of the sky. A man near the piano with a forgotten beer in one hand made a groaning, slobbering sound. The man in black stood over Nort, grinning down at him. The wind howled and shrieked and thrummed. Something large struck the side of the building, hard enough to make it shake, and then bounced away. One of the men at the bar tore himself free and headed for some quieter locale, moving in great, grotesque strides. Thunder racketed the sky with a sound like some god coughing. "'All right!' the man in black grinned. "'All right, let's get down to it!' He began to spit into Nort's face, aiming carefully. The spittle gleamed on the corpse's forehead, purled down the shaven beak of his nose. Under the bar, her hands worked faster. Sheb laughed, loon-like, and hunched over. He began to cough up phlegm, huge and sticky gobs of it, and let fly. The man in black roared approval and pounded him on the back. Sheb grinned, one gold tooth twinkling. Some fled. Others gathered in a loose ring around Nort, his face and the dewlapped rooster wrinkles of his neck and upper chest gleamed with liquid, liquid so precious in this dry country. And suddenly the rain of spit stopped, as if on signal. There was ragged, heavy breathing. The man in black suddenly lunged across the body, jackknifing over it in a smooth arc. It was pretty, like a flash of water. He caught himself on his hands, sprang to his feet in a twist, grinning, and went over again. One of the watchers forgot himself, began to applaud, and suddenly backed away, eyes cloudy with terror. He slobbered a hand across his mouth and made for the door. Nort twitched the third time the man in black went across. A sound went through the watchers, a grunt, and then they were silent. The man in black threw his head back and howled. His chest moved in a quick, shallow rhythm as he sucked air. He began to go back and forth at a faster clip, pouring over Nort's body like water poured from one glass to another, and then back again. The only sound in the room was the tearing rasp of his respiration and the rising pulse of the storm. There came the moment when Nort drew a deep, dry breath. His hands rattled and pounded aimlessly on the table. Sheb screeched and exited. One of the women followed him, her eyes wide and her wimple billowing. The man in black went across once more, twice, thrice, the body on the table was vibrating now, trembling and rapping and twitching like a large yet essentially lifeless doll with some monstrous clockwork hidden inside. The smell of rot and excrement and decay billowed up in choking waves. There came a moment when his eyes opened. Ali felt her numb and feelingless feet propelling her backward. She struck the mirror, making it shiver, and blind panic took over. She bolted like a steer. "'So here's your wonder,' the man in black called after her, panting. "'I've given it to you. "'Now you can sleep easy. "'Even that isn't irreversible. "'Although it's so goddamn funny.' "'And he began to laugh again. "'The sound faded as she raced up the stairs, "'not stopping until the door to the three rooms above the bar was bolted. "'She began to giggle then.' Rocking back and forth on her haunches by the door, the sound rose to a keening wail that mixed with the wind. She kept hearing the sound Nort had made when he came back to life, the sound of fists knocking blindly on the lid of a coffin. What thoughts, she wondered, could be left in his reanimated brain? What had he seen while dead? How much did he remember? Would he tell? Were the secrets of the grave waiting downstairs? The most terrible thing about such questions, she reckoned, was that part of you really wanted to ask. 
below her, Nort wandered absently out into the storm to pull some weed. The man in black, now the only patron in the bar, perhaps watched him go, perhaps still grinning. When she forced herself to go back down that evening, carrying a lamp in one hand and a heavy stick of stove wood in the other, the man in black was gone, rig and all. But Nort was there, sitting at the table by the door as if he had never been away. The smell of the weed was on him, but not as heavily as she might have expected. He looked up at her and smiled tentatively. Hello, Allie. Hello, Nort. She put the stove wood down and began lighting the lamps, not turning her back to him. I've been touched by God, he said presently. I ain't going to die no more, he said so. It was a promise. How nice for you, Nort. The spill she was holding dropped through her trembling fingers, and she picked it up. I'd like to stop chewing the grass, he said. I don't enjoy it no more. It don't seem right for a man touched by God to be chewing the weed. Then why don't you stop? Her exasperation had startled her into looking at him as a man again, rather than an infernal miracle. What she saw was a rather sad-looking specimen, only half-stoned, looking hang-dog and ashamed. She could not be frightened by him any more. "'I shake,' he said, "'and I want it. I can't stop. Allie, you was always good to me.' He began to weep. "'I can't even stop peeing myself. What am I?' What am I? She walked to the table and hesitated there, uncertain. He could have made me not want it, he said through the tears. He could have done that if he could have made me be alive. I ain't complaining. I don't want to complain. He stared around hauntedly and whispered, He might strike me dead if I did. Maybe it's a joke. He seemed to have quite a sense of humor. Nor took his poke from where it dangled inside his shirt and brought out a handful of grass. Unthinkingly, she knocked it away and then drew her hand back, horrified. I can't help it, Allie. I can't. And he made a crippled dive for the poke. She could have stopped him, but she made no effort. She went back to lighting the lamps, tired, although the evening had barely begun. But nobody came in that night except old man Kennelly, who had missed everything. He did not seem particularly surprised to see Nort. Perhaps someone had told him what had happened. He ordered beer, asked where Sheb was, and pawed her. Later, Nort came to her and held out a folded piece of paper in one shaky, no-right-to-be-alive hand. "'He left you this,' he said. "'I near forgot. "'If I'd forgot, he would have come back and killed me, sure.' Paper was valuable, a commodity much to be treasured, but she didn't like to handle this. It felt heavy, nasty. Written on it, was a single word. Allie. How do you know my name? She asked Nort. And Nort only shook his head. She opened it and read this. You want to know about death. I left him a word. That word is nineteen. If you say it to him... His mind will be opened. He will tell you what lies beyond. He will tell you what he saw. The word is nineteen. Knowing will drive you mad. But sooner or later, you will ask. You won't be able to help yourself. Have a nice day. Walter O'Dim. P.
P.S. The word is nineteen. You will try to forget, but sooner or later it will come out of your mouth like vomit. Nineteen. And, oh dear God, she knew that she would. Already it trembled on her lips. Nineteen, she would say. No, listen, nineteen. And the secrets of death and the land beyond would be open to her. Sooner or later you will ask. Nineteen. 